we're just going to go. Oh, I'm, I'm having bad allergies issues today. But, and I wasn't actually going to stream because my eyes and all that are jacked up. But I think it's an important day. I had uh, one of the, I have a handful of folks that come over when they feel really freaked out about the market in general. And we just kind of talk through some of the, you know, like what are some of the indicators? What are some of the issues um, that are out there? Especially if they're like, th- sometimes people run into things that I don't even see that I haven't heard about, like like the latest uh, Verge thing. And we'll talk about that. I got one of the uh, good articles up and we're going to go through it and we're going to talk through it technically of like what's happening with um, the Verge network right now when it comes to the proof of work and how the hackers are doing what they're doing and explain and differentiate on how other cryptocurrencies that work on proof of work, um, one, how they could be susceptible um, if the right amount of power came onto it and they were able to do in these time exploits that are happening. But we'll, we'll get into that in, in a second. But bottom line, I have a lot of folks that come over um, and, you know, want to have a discussion, want to have a, a kind of, a, I would call it a review of the basics. Like, okay, I'm seeing all these things about how the uh, space is getting hacked or some, you know, there's a lot of FUD that comes out, a lot of confusion, a lot of new editors and folks that are new to the space um, and don't really fundamentally understand on how, you know, proof of work, how mining, how even like when it comes to the ICOs, how cryptocurrency in general functions like mechanically. Um, and a lot of speculation, a lot of BS comes up. And so what usually I'm here writing stuff on the back of the whiteboard. This is why I have a whiteboard here because like folks will come over, um, and they will ask, you know, a lot of technical questions. Like I don't, I want to put my mind around it. What's happening? Why is this happening? Um, and how can it happen type of thing? Um, you know, for something like the Verge network. So we'll, we'll get into what that is here in a second. And, um, and then I started explaining just kind of how proof of work works, why there's incentives out there, why would somebody want to attack the network, all that kind of stuff. So I felt like after having about a good two hour conversation today, after I was done doing the stuff that I was doing with work today, um, I I really should have just turned on the live stream and just went with it and just you know focused on what I was talking about because what I had covered was I would say a very in depth discussion about. Um, the space in general and uh you know things that can happen with like let's say verge um with its current issue um this little box is annoying the hell out of me i'm gonna get rid of you all right um so thanks for that subscribe marcus um so i wanted to get into it i got a i went ahead and pulled up an article that was put out on may 11th when the first verge attack happened And I wanted to kind of go through it together with you guys. One, we'll have a very clear and concise kind of work through or walk through. And then I can kind of give some commentary as we're going through it to explain it on how maybe it correlates with other cryptocurrencies. Can others uh, have an issue like this uh, type of issue and stuff? I think it would be valuable um, as a value contribution to the community. And then we can re-upload this to YouTube and people can share it and all that kind of stuff. So... Uh, I'm not going to read it word for word for you, but we'll go through it and let everybody understand the premise behind it. Because sometimes when people read, I don't call it even a technical uh, discussion, but there's going to be words and concepts in there that you may read the words but not understand how it functions. So I'm going to try best to kind of articulate that. And what I'm going to ask from you guys here in the um, Twitch channel is if you guys are not picking up (coughs) um, anything, uh, if you're if you're having an issue with something, just bring it up in the chat, and I'll I'll take a look, and we can answer some questions um, specifically. But what we're gonna get into right now, we got about fifty people in. I feel bad for all the YouTube bros, but I mean, sorry um, if the software was consistent, and every time I turned on real stream and it worked, then we would do it. Thanks, Banshee, for that. Uh, that's subscribe, buddy. Um, let's switch over to this article and we will discuss it yes i am using the eth pill on my nvidia cards by the way um so this is by daniel goldman it's a very good article it came out on may 11th or yeah i think he just updated it. maybe it's may 14th it was 11 minute read may 14th sorry um 
<clears throat> and what he tries to do is explain the concept in proof of work of the potential for time warps, uh, mining exploits, denial service attacks, and uh, some additional stuff. And this was targeted on the very first uh, issue that Verge had earlier in the month, right? Um, of kind of a, a synopsis of what happened and how did a uh, Verge currency, which is the XVG, um, get an exploit on it. And what I want to differentiate when we get into here, and people can kind of cut it both ways. Uh, so when we say something has been hacked, opening up the container of previous blocks and changing data is a lot different. The affecting the immutability of something and like reversing transactions and that is changing the sanctity of the blockchain. As far as we know right now, what's going on is people are exploiting and manipulating the functions that are built onto the currency right now between multiple algorithms to change the outcome of the difficulty level to be able to effectively perform a insta mine on the currency and be able to have a very high probability with a very limited amount of hash power um, to mint a lot of the currency a lot faster. So it, it, ex, exceedingly fast uh, block times. So I'm giving you a real quick synopsis. So as we start to go through this, you have a basic understanding of the difference when you're when we're talking hacking um, of the currency. And from what I understand right now, there has been no reverse of transactions. I've seen some people say, oh, they're reverse in Pornhub transactions and all that. But being able to rewrite the transaction history is a whole different scale of a, a of a issue or a, of an attack, a purpose, um, all kinds of things to make uh, that are significantly harder than just exploiting a feature to propagate the natural order of a block propagation and the incentive that's given to it. And I'm going to explain that on the whiteboard here in a minute of how things functions for you guys kind of get it. But what this attack right now is, is just moving things forward very fastly and having a very high probability of getting a lot of the currency in a very quick order um, versus changing history. That's a whole other rabbit hole. So um, which from, again, my understanding is not, has not occurred. They have not changed history. They're just speeding future up. Um, so we, let's get into this. So we have this article. I'm going to give a lot of props to this guy. Uh, on the YouTube video, I did, did link this. Um, and <clears throat> and we'll get into can other cryptocurrencies have this effect. Because um, there's some speculation that they could. But there's, there's something very specific with Verge, I think, that allows this. Um, but let's get into this. So essentially, the, the article starts off with trying to set the baseline. It's saying that cryptocurrency enthusiasts tell ordinary civilians how safe and secure the blockchain protocols are and uh, indeed they are very very secure when it comes to bitcoin ethereum very mainstream high uh, a high amount of proof of work security on both of those currencies um and very hard to directly attack brute force or change um a direct effect with those particular types of currencies with this kind of attack that's going on right now. So it starts off just saying, Hey, you know, this isn't like a proclamation that cryptocurrency in general has been, uh, has been uncovered to be able to be exploitable or hacked. This is very specific to verge in the way it functions with its ability to retarget block time. And the fact that it uses five algorithms um, and it can be used simultaneously across all five of those algorithms to solve this. So I wanted that the, the, the fact that Daniel starts with that is kind of just setting this, the tone of this to say, Hey, some, some bad stuff happens as we learn new um, ways to, you know, build new cryptocurrencies, try to mint different, uh, you know, blockchain networks, and this particular one has an issue, but it doesn't mean that right now out of the gate, Bitcoin and Ethereum would have something like this. So he's kind of predicating that right away. Then he comes in there. However, we'll go into the, go a step further and declare that cryptocurrencies are literally unhackable. This at the very least is a tactical error since the proliferation of unhackable meme forces enthusiasts into some awkward positions when certain events unfold, like we say a hack. So what he's saying in English is saying that if we say something is unhackable, 
It comes down to the concept of what do you mean by unhackable? Is that change in history or is that exploiting features that will allow you to make modifications to the outcomes of events? So on a blockchain, the basic concept of blockchains in general are the fact that I'm going to give you the few components and we'll switch back to this. And I'm sorry if this is a weird way of teaching for people, but um, the generality of what's going on in, is the fact that you and I or some other person can make a transaction without a third party. With that, you have essentially a memory queue that is the block time. So what happens is, is on Verge's case, I think it's 30 seconds, right? So any transactions that happen between people are within those 30 seconds are, are included in potentially the next block provided the memory, the memory, uh, the size of the block has enough space to, to write into it. For that effort, miners are rewarded for validating the blocks and for the fact of, you know, posting that transaction to the chain, right? So the incentive for us to hold the network up is to facilitate the transaction that people want to make. And that's essentially what I was kind of explaining here uh, to folks that came over today is explaining the incentive mechanism, why we mine, why we have a network out there. If people build things on top of it, that's great. That gets us more transaction um, value. You know, there will have not just the incentive, that's the inflation of the currency, but we'll also have a transactional value. That's by and large, the main argument from like a Bitcoin cash's perspective saying, we're going to build all these lanes. We can take on the world of transactions because we have these massive blocks. And if everybody uses it as currency, we have the space to facilitate it. Where old with, with Bitcoin in general, 10 minute blocks, Small, small blocks can't fit a lot in the block. So if you have a high amount of transactions that have to occur in that much time, you'll get some bottlenecking, right? So I'm just giving you some basic understanding of how blocks and propagation works with regards to the incentive that's done on a cryptocurrency network. So I don't know the exact block amount that comes out on a Verge, a typical Verge block. I don't mind Verge. Um, but, you know, for like a Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, uh, uh, Raven coin, Raven coins, one minute block time, 5,000 coins per one minute, right? So the reward for us doing that, and if we're part of a pool that wins, that gets that reward. So what's happened in this particular case with Verge is the the folks that took on this kind of task here to say, oh, you don't think it's unhackable? Well, we see some flaws and they exploited some of these flaws <coughs> to be able to speed up that that block time. So when they come back in here and they say, you know, last month, an unidentified hacker, this is the first Verge attack that we're talking about, which happened uh, early or I think late last month. And this article came out on the 14th. And now we have a new attack that's happening right now. It looks it's saying, yeah, April 4th and through 6th, the mysterious hacker managed to dominate the network in three occasion intervals within several hours over the course of this time during April 4th and 6th. And was effectively able to, well, now they say counterfeit and I, I, I'm, I'm loosely using, this is not, uh, I don't know if I would agree necessarily with the effectively counterfeiting with the fact that they exploited the functionality within the Verge cryptocurrency to move the block time very rapidly versus not just 30 seconds, but almost instantly and instantly mine this many Verge coins per second, roughly $80 per second minting over a million dollars worth of the cryptocurrency over that time, right? So when you start looking at, um, at counterfeiting, counterfeiting would, would deter, would that, that word usage there concerned me just because it's not that they're minting uh, currency that would not have been done. It's just they've sped it up because they've changed the block time interval to make the difficulty extremely low. And... The, huh, I see a green screen. Uh, you refresh, buddy. Um, so the 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 exploit there is not necessarily uh, uh, fake currency, right? It's real currency because there's a schedule. And w <coughs> let me uh, let me clear this. And I'm going to explain this. We're going to go through this article. Hopefully, you guys like the deep dive. This is the point of this. I want to go kind of deep on this one and make sure people understand functionally and mechanically what's going on. Um, let's get this. Cool, go deep. Um, 
<laughs> so I don't I don't know what the the actual reward is on a on a verge. Somebody could give me that real quick. Uh, I'll do this right now on uh, an example of Raven. Don't get confused. Raven doesn't have an issue, but I'll do it from a blockchain perspective and a reward perspective until somebody gives me the actual verge currency uh, uh, normal thirty second output. But if this was essentially a Raven thing, five thousand coins per one minute block. So one block. 5,000 coins right now is the current schedule on something like Raven. So over one minute, let's say only three transactions occurred and you had a transaction fee, very nominal. Now one Raven's only worth about three cents. Now one Verge is worth uh, uh, five cents, eight cents. I don't remember what it totally is. Maybe 15 cents. It's probably a lot less right now. Um, But essentially the summation of those currency transactions that happened in that one minute that are included in that next block would be essentially that essentially that and if you guys can't fully see that what i wrote was if there was three transactions and they were essentially 60,000 satoshis 40,000 satoshis and 20,000 satoshis of a equivalent raven coin you would essentially have 5,000.0120 as your block reward for that particular block because you mined essentially the block and posted the transactions and it got those fees plus the block reward, right? So on something like Raven, it's, it's 5,000 coins per one minute plus all the transaction fees. On something like Verge, somebody got that 730. So 730 is the block reward. Um, two 30 seconds two minute 30 second blocks so in in two minutes and 30 seconds you get 730 coins so you can see in this article what the problem was is that and let's roll back real quick let's go back to the fundamentals and then i'll come back to what verge is right now um uh, what what the issue what they're talking about in verge so if the block time the way the difficult works is more people that mine this network the, the whole point of the cryptocurrency is to say, I have a schedule. And over that schedule, I'm going to give so much cryptocurrency over a period of time. So my, if my block time is one minute, or in Verge's case, two minutes and 30 seconds, and I have a an inflation for the participation of mining this network of 730 coins, then it's you have a uh, uh, an estimation a, a known known schedule of where what the distribution needs to be. So what happens is there's a, there's factoring that is done in how much hash power is contributed to the network, and then there's a refactoring of how difficult the problem is to ensure that the consistency over a period of time is roughly holds that block time. So all that in English again is if we take it, and I, I keep bringing it back to Raven, and I'll go back and forth with Verge because I know a lot more about Raven than I know Verge. But um, in Raven's case, if you had a huge amount of crash power that came over to it really quick, and then you started getting blocks in 45 seconds, it's going to retarget pretty quick, right? It's going to retarget after so many blocks. And you're, so if it's knocking blocks out in 30 seconds because you have so much more hash power, you're able to solve the essentially the proof-of-work solution. And for the folks that don't understand how proof of work works, there's all kinds of excellent, even by hand explanations on how to solve a proof of work problem, SHA-256 and all the different algorithms. But let's just say in the most simplest form I can explain it is thing. And this, I will give props to Troy. I think it's Troy Black, Troy Ron, Ron Troy. I don't know. It's one of the developers of Raven. He had a really good, a very simple explanation of it. So if you can think of just a number line, And on that number line, I need, to, I need to find that line. So all of our hashes that are going on, it doesn't matter if it's Verge, Ravencoin, it doesn't matter. The algorithm is just the, the, the mechanism and the, the, the business rules of what we're trying to do to find those numbers on that number line. And that's all of our hits trying to find it. So when we're sitting there submitting hashes and shares, we're punching a whole bunch of numbers saying, I think I got it. I think I got it. I think I got it. And then when that primer, that number is found, when miner 001 and whatever pull finds it, they say, hey, I actually found it. 
the network has a consensus and looks at the math problem and says, yep, you know what, bro, you got it. It rewards them for that effort. And that effort is gauged, that timeline that occurs is trying to gauge that at the block time. So if the block time for something like Raven is one minute, or if the block time for Verge is two minutes and 30 seconds, that problem is the difficulty is adjusted based on the throughput on the network. So what I'm giving you guys all this history for is because I want to make sure that you guys um, understand as we start to go through this article of why attacking some of the sub functions in there of how time and timestamps and all this other stuff, how it gets to the information to understand how much hash powers on it by and how much, uh, and by all the, the amount of inf information that's being transacted on it and how, how transactions come in and how they're unsorted and all this other stuff that happens on, that gets bottled up in these blocks. When we start to get into that, you kind of understand when we say that, hey, that should have been two minutes and 30 seconds, but it's at one second and I'm just blasting out the amount. I'm, I, I'm sub one second. If we're at 1,530 coins or 1,570 coins per second, then we're solving more than a block in a second right? It's multiple, right? So um, that's essentially what, what happens. And we've seen some of this kind of uh, behavior, not from a verge attack standpoint, but from a, a difficulty issue of retargeting when we saw the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash split, when a lot of hash power came off of Bitcoin and Bitcoin went into essentially what they call a death loop to where you have such a difficult problem that all the number line it's, we'll never find the probability of finding the solution to solve the next block to move it down the list because Bitcoin does not retarget itself until after so many blocks. So if you have a very limited amount of hash power on there, you have an issue if you're trying to solve blocks fast enough to retarget based on the hash rate. So long story short, proof of work kind of recap spent 20 minutes trying to explain that. Now let's get back into the article. Hopefully that helped explain some stuff and maybe we can get into some more detail, but just trying to let you guys help understand on how difficult work um, and why this matters. Um, let's get in back to the article. So um, if we go in and see, let's, let's start right back up here. So in such event, it seems that nothing else explained in, in order last month. The, oh, we already went through this. So this was the, the attack from last month here as it explained of how much cryptocurrency was, was generated from Verge's network from the hackers. No need to be around the bush. This was a disaster. Yes, this is, a, this is like a quintessential big issue. Like you had, a, you had somebody that was able to generate a million dollars without all the effort. Um, um, and, it, you know, I would, I would call this almost worse than like an exchange hack because an exchange hack's pretty linear. It's, you know, you have some keys somewhere. You have a hot wallet. You have somebody that, that brute force or gets some kind of incentive or some kind of insight to be able to get into the exchange and then just move coins. Nothing, there's really nothing pinnacle about that. That is the digital version of a Western busting into a bank and stealing some money, right? Uh, and that happens quite a bit because of the way the, just the, no matter how secure a blockchain is, if you just have a key to that, uh, a key to a hot wallet, and you can move coins without any kind of other two factor or any kind of other, you know, multi uh, signature signing, um, if you can move some of these coins, you can move some of these coins. It's no different than taking money, taking their wallet from them. There's not a lot of science behind that. This particular thing is attacking the, the structure, the ecosystem directly by manipulating the variables in the, you know, in the currency in general or, or in the crypto network in general to exploit a, you know, a bug. Um, so this is a, a pretty big issue. So, you know, people like to try to blame like, hey, they should have seen this. I mean, and what I would say is, and, and I don't know anybody in the Verge community in general, I don't know any of the developers, but I do know development. I'm around development all the time. And yes, humans are fallible. Um, and it, this, I think herein lies a lot of the issues in general with, with cryptocurrencies when they have exponential growth, especially in the altcoin space. And it's not just ICOs or any of that. It's just like when you have like exponential growth um, in any space like this, and you have lots of real money coming into it, um, th this just stings a lot harder, right? Um, 
because the incentive and I, I think it's it's this weird Pandora's box thing. If the incentive is high enough, you're going to have you're going to have a test of all attack vectors known man, known to man on this kind of stuff. So you're going to see and when you see somebody like Charlie Lee coming out and saying, hey, this just makes the whole ecosystem stronger. It does with a huge penalty of failure. Right. So. And then, yeah, you have like crypto, crypto junkie here. You're, you're saying, you know, is this something that the devs have their hands in? Do they know? Is this inside job? Um, you know, there's a lot of issues that can be seen. Now, the thing about people, if they're part of an ecosystem and then they happen to run into a lot of money uh, and they didn't have a lot of money or and I mean, I'm not saying that the, a lot of the developers get super rich on this stuff, but I know quite a bit of developers. I know a lot of people that put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in this stuff. And a lot of this stuff is like uh, people aren't coming out real rich. I mean, they may have been part of developing something, but it didn't mean that they had a bag of it, right? Because, I mean, money begets money of uh, of uh, at scale. So, like, if you short of maybe a few developers out there that are pretty known for trying to create bags... Um, I mean, I don't know if these guys in particular um, would have done something directly or if this was just a case that they just missed it. And, you know, this is an, an attack vector. The fact that it's happening again almost a month and a half later is kind of a scary thing. Like, dudes, like blood, sweat and tears. Don't go to sleep. Get this stuff fixed. I mean, disable a couple of the, the algorithms, something. Right. So. You've been accused of such things. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to get into like speculating the, the person's character or something in there, but we're going to stay with the, the just the the content in general, what we're talking through on this article, and then we'll talk through some of the techni technicalities in general of uh, the currency. So, you know, this is more of just, you know, Daniel just asking some questions of like who's to blame type of thing. But let's get into like what it is, what the problem is here. So with these sorts of uh, breaches, many inevitable remain murky however in this case fundamental exploits were pretty fairly understood so it comes into the timestamps boofing and this is this is really good the reason why i like this article and going through this is it really kind of starts to explain on how things in a distributed fashion work and especially if you're not familiar with the way cryptocurrencies work and you work in like a database world kind of how things come together because in the database world you do a lot of things to try to keep things in sync when it comes to timing and what that means is is then you have a, a space in the in the kind of like commercial world you have databases and you have events that occur and if if you have things that come in you'll get into situations if you have a very distributed system in like a closed like commercial system and you get in you can get into a thing if you don't keep your time your times in check you can get into events where you can get an update before a create and what that means is, is it doesn't matter what program we're talking about or what kind of system if it's a supply chain or whatever but if you got an order to update something think of anything it doesn't matter you get this order update this wait what that doesn't exist right you need that you want to have the create before the update Right. So in the database world, you want to have things succinct. You got to reorder things so you can get these collection and batches. So they do a lot of these things. Some things are done asynchronously sometimes, but sometimes you have to get into batch order stuff, so which means you collect everything over a time period. You say, I don't care what happens. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it in this time gate. You have a, you have 10 minutes. Whatever happened to that 10 minutes, I'm going to process. If I get an update before I create, it's going to go to the, the buffer and it's going to hang out and wait for the create to come back in. So I'm giving you that kind of explanation is you're probably going to go into your mind, even if you're not a database person, and you're going to be like, why the hell do they let things come out of order? So that's where we're going into this next section here is saying, you know, the root exploit is something that would appear uh, to be a bug, but actually is deliberate feature. The ability to create an inaccurate timestamp, the blockchain protocols, individual transactions, you, uh, payments from one party to another are grouped together in a single block. And we see that in general in cryptocurrency, right? If I'm sending money to you, part of that whole mechanism is to ensure there's some validation from the miners, right? The miners say, hey, party A is starting to send it to party B. Do, we, do, do they have the money? Can their, can their accounts reconcile? And it sets in that, it sets in that mempool, right? And you start getting validation. That's why like in Bitcoin, you start, you send money to somebody and the block times are 10 minutes. Pretty much right away, within a few seconds, you'll probably get a confirmation. You'll get a confirmation. You got one of six, right? 
you'll get two of six, 10 of six, whatever. If the blocks are really slow, it won't post and reconcile the ledger until after the block is posted, right? So you can have all kinds of confirmations to say, ah, we all think this is good, but until that's actually posted to a block and then another block comes in and more transactions, that block header from that previous block is included in the next block. So now all those transactions are all hashed together. And why that's relevant and why I'm kind of going all over the place with this guys, to, but I'm trying to just explain it to you in the way I explain it to people when they come over here. And that way, hopefully you guys can glean some of this. But what, why, it's so, why it's so critical is that all those transactions in that block, it doesn't matter what cryptocurrency, it doesn't matter Verge, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, it doesn't matter. All the blocks, all their transactions are hashed together. And all that means is just like if I was going to take a snapshot of all this stuff, transactions, stuff moving around, metadata that people included in it, whatever. I take all that, and if I'm going to blueprint that, think of it like a blueprint, right? I'm going to take a snapshot. I'm going to get a header. I'm going to include that in the next thing saying, well, as long as I have this piece of information, I know everything to the left is good. Stuff that's happened. Because if anybody goes and tries to change that, it's not going to line up with the stuff to the right. It's going to say, wait a minute, dude. That don't match this because you made one little tiny itsy bitsy change, and it's going to change all the stuff downstream. That's what gives us the, the immutability of past information. So it's very critical to have blocks posted. And that's why what you'll see is a, um, you'll see like if you're buying something big, like if you're trying to use cryptocurrency to purchase like a car or something, and you'll see yeah, after 250 transactions, even some exchanges, right? Some exchanges will be like, uh, well, yeah, after 250 confirmations and you're like, man, I send it to my buddy and it happens right away. So why is the exchange taking her sweet ass time? Right. Because the exchange is taking a lot of counterparty risk that they're a target and they're going to have a lot of tax surfaces of people trying to send them and double spend stuff. And if they're just immediately reconciling because all they're doing is they're po they're that you send money to them, they essentially see that they reconcile it and then they make you a database entry and what you have on their exchange. Right. You're not you're not creating a transaction when you're on like Poloniex on chain. You're in a database and it might be MySQL, It might be MSSQL. Who knows? You're in a database that has a reference to what you have. And then you're making all your transactions. That's what keeps the transaction speed to be able to do millions of transactions per second or whatever they need to have. It's not going to be millions. It's going to be probably tens of thousands per second maybe even a hundred, couple hundred thousand per second, depending on their, their speed. I don't know. Anybody's used Poloniex in a while, but you know, uh, Binance, any of those things, they're using a database and then they'll go back. And when you're ready to withdraw, they'll make a transaction out of their hot wallet, send it back to you. Now it's back on chain. Right? So, um, the, what I was going with that is like, if you're making a big purchase, uh, they're not going to, they're not going to have the infrastructure to sit there and go out there and look at you know, like, let's go scan all the, the transactions during the blockchain. What they're doing is they're saying 250 transactions. By that time, there's going to be several blocks because the average time to get 250 transactions means that it's probably going to take about 20 minutes. And if you have 20 minutes, you have at least two blocks on block Bitcoin. If you're using something like Raven, you'd have 20 blocks ahead of that. So they have very high confidence that nothing's going to change after that reconciliation. So... Let me get back to this. I'm, I'm trying to go through it in detail with you guys as I start to explain this, why the timestamping stuff is important. So in blockchain protocols, individual transactions, usually payment to one to another are grouped in a, in together in a single block and then confirmed as a whole. And that's what I was talking about. Like all those transactions in one, in, in Verge's standpoint, if it's two minutes and 30 seconds, all the transactions that occurred in two minutes and 30 seconds, every, everybody's transactions, right, wrong, or different, whatever, it's all in there. And it's going to post. It's going to reconcile itself in that much time. Every block comes with a timestamp when it's created. The block protocol functions properly in the order in these transactions, sometimes out of sequence. Blocks may have a may have a hundred may have a time or block one hundred rather. They're talking about the unit block one hundred may have a timestamp that may actually come after block one hundred one. This is because the decentralized networks obsonate the reuse in, uh, refuse. <clears throat> to grant any special authority to third parties, accurately enforcing the, the time synchronization is no simple matter. Given the unpredictability of the variance and the time that it takes for data to propagate through a peer-to-peer -peer network, then it's entirely possible for a block to appear out of order when all parties are being perfectly honest. In other words, it's only fair to some degree to have some flexibility in the case of Verge 
before the hack anyways, is the protocol allowed nodes to disagree with the time of the time window by up to two hours. Now that seems really excessive and I don't know why they're why they're coded that way for two hours is like like I wouldn't transact with any like somebody send me money on that. I'd be like, bro, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Right. So uh, the int the entry point for hackers to start spoofing timestamp and submitting blocks that appear from the past are still within the allotted two hour window, thus eligible for acceptance by other nodes. Why this would be all why this ultimately matter for network security has to do with the nature of proof of work mining. You know, so like, so bottom line, I don't know about the two hour thing. I don't have to look into it for another currency, but the two hours seems very, very long. Um, but bottom line, it, it's the order of transactions because you have a huge, all the nodes are syncing the same data. So uh, every node out there, they, they're syncing essentially the same ledger and they have to reconcile and there's a lot of transactions going on. And so it's this, it's this huge rolling wave of, of what block are you on? Right. So, um, and they're going to get different information. And at the, after two hours and they're all reconciled is essentially what it's saying uh, up to that point from two hours in the past. Right. Um, for verge, the target. Oh, okay. So let's get the keep the verge network decentralized requires ensuring a fair small amount of scale devices. Say MacBooks can participate in running the network software and turn. It means time limiting the volume of payment activity on the network. The setting is clear block time in turn is limited to the network's transactions per second. For Verge, the target of one block is 30, one block is per 30 seconds. So it's 30 seconds, not two minutes and 30 seconds. I don't know where somebody saw that. Maybe it changed, but they're saying here it's 30 seconds. Now, one might ask, given the network's decentralization, how could this be enforced? While stopping the party submit the blocks much faster rate. There is no trivial problem that is accepted. Block earns the submitter a block reward. It is the submitter's incentive to confirm the blocks as fast as possible. So, um, given the acceptance of the block earns the submitter a block reward. So, yeah, so it's part, just part of the proof of work cycle. So, you want to do it as fast as possible. There's no incentive not to because then you're just not going to get paid. To answer this in short proof of work mining, the block to consider valid on the network, it must contain the solution for the cryptographic difficulty computational problem derived directly from the data from the block itself. And that's what that part, why I explained to you before this is why I was explaining to you of all what that meant. Like if you read that and you're like, okay, that sounds cool, but I don't understand what it meant. What that meant was that it included the block header from the previous blocks. That's what makes that, that computation work is saying that I believe the hash is this because it was derived from the stuff that was prior. Right. So I wanted to make sure you guys understood that the nature of this problem is that the difficulty can be freely adjusted. The target block time for verge is one block every 30 seconds. The difficulty of the mining block is consistently being adjusted based on the current block confirmations. That's a little different. If more people decided to to devote more mining power to the generating blocks and the block started to get mined faster, the protocol increases the difficulty. This is typical in every cryptocurrency, by the way. It's just Verge looks like it does this off of a, a mechanism that's looking at the confirmations, the current rate of block confirmations. Uh, that's Maybe that's just the way he worded it. I, don't, maybe, I think that's just general proof of work. Um, but I'm not seeing when it, like, like Bitcoin has some hard-coded stuff. After so many blocks, it will retarget um, the difficulty uh, on some other cryptocurrencies. It has other mechanisms to automatically after like eight blocks, it'll, it'll readjust. Um, it looks like it could do it pretty quick here though. Uh, the protocol increases the mining difficulty. We know that conversely, the mining power lowers the block. If it, inc if block time increases, making mining easier. And that's that whole death loop prevention is what I'm talking about. So like if you had, let's say hundred Terra hash on a network and then Tomorrow you went down. It went down to twenty because it became very worthless. Well, now it would just sit there, and it would ne that last block that it's on would be so difficult that all the hash power on it could never solve that block. Thereby, it would never retarget. So, a lot of cryptocurrencies have adjusted the ability to be a lot more agile when it comes to its block difficulty, especially in the the altcoin world, because you can have this ebb and flow of cryptocurrency mining, especially GPU cryptocurrency mining, when you have sites like what to mine, where you're going to have uh, that and what uh, nice hash, we're going to have people moving cryptocurrency uh, mining power around to try to get the most profitable coin. What to mine is wrong, it is 30 seconds. 
Um, yeah. So uh, conversely, as mining power lowers, the block time increases that we were talked that thus when properly functioning, it's even real messy world role factors change economic fluctuations. This is kind of what I'm talking about here, like when pricing and all that kind of stuff changes. The version network is per perpetually reacting and guiding to the network on the target block rate is equal ribbon. Verge is not the only one that does this. Every cryptocurrency out there does this in some fashion. Some just have different business rules of how they do it. Some do it after a certain amount of blocks. Some have it every other block like ubik and raven all the, they, they all have a adjustment after block so many blocks um i think bitcoin cash changed theirs to do it after um eight blocks i think or something so uh <coughs> that's just not a verge problem or verge function that's every function <coughs> so nothing leaned really here any different than really any other other cryptocurrencies the algorithm the Verge uses to calculate the current difficulty is known as the dark gravity wave. This involves taking a weighted average of the rate of block confirmations over a moving two-hour window. So there it is. There's, there's their business rule on how that functions and works. And so it's over a two-hour period that it's, it's calculating what it needs to adjust the difficulty to. So it's not based on blocks. It's a bit more complex as the details really don't matter here what what matters is the mining difficulty is a function of the block frequency and the f the running of calculations on block frequency naturally involves looking up blocks timestamps so right there you're kind of seeing this kind of i would call this a kind of a loop kind of a problem where i can start to see how if you were able to manipulate certain settings you could advance the the block propagation if you can if you can trick the the amount of difficulty that's out there and then control enough hash power to be able to do it hence the problem here fairly full uh, time timestamps are getting created all bets are off and this is what the hacker did examining the block data reveals through the duration of the hack that every other block was submitted with a timestamp roughly one hour before the present time tragically confusing the mining protocols adjustment algorithm and if the protocol uh, were sent in, in fluid in English, it would be saying that something like, oh no, there's not enough blocks have been submitted recently. Mining must be too difficult. Let's make it easier. So I mean, he's explaining right there of what's going on. So he kind of does it in a very interesting way of saying if the, if, if the blockchain was sent in it and it could say, say it in English, it's saying, hey, there's uh, uh, the time has passed and this is horrible. Not enough has happened. Let's make it as simple as possible. Since the timestamps were continuously being spoofed, the protocol continuously lowered the difficulty until mining got laughably easy. To give a general idea, the difficulty in the hours before the initial attack was a very large number. That's a zero. That's a zero. 13 million um, difficulty. Let's just think. Don't worry about like what that number means. Just know it's big. It's 13.9 million. While the attack got it as low as 0.0002 and decrease the difficulty over 99.9999% um the lower lower the difficulty in the block means the blocks more blocks get submitted in this case roughly a block every second it was a little more than that if it was getting almost 1500 it was probably two blocks a second at that point um the cleverness of this attack and how it circumvents the barrier mining difficulty instead attempted to burst through it is if the security provided by the mining power is a gate surrounding the network. So he's trying to give you an analogy here is saying if the security provided by the mining power. Now, remember, we talk about how much mining power is the security of a network. And if you contextualize that into a gate surrounding a network or let's say a building, the gate is too strong to break through and too high to climb over. Yet this attack found a way to bypass it by lowering it close to the ground so it could be stepped over. So that's the analogy, essentially. So the gate was still there. The structure of the blockchain was still there. The functionality, the history, everything's still there. It was just able to manipulate the, the game. It was kind of, a, I would call this almost a dimensional attack, right? So where it's, it's like, I'm not changing the way everything is. I'm just changing the perception of the way everything is, right? If it already isn't obvious, this in in itself is bad news. The violation of an intended protocol is blatant as simply is not a good look. Additionally, the drastic increase in the block submissions rate means a lot more newly minted coin of the verge than the protocol had allowed, uh, allotted. 
Uh, I mean, so I don't know what what Verge's long term protocol was, if it ha had a fixed limit or whatever. But all that would happen is it would just a lot. You would just advance time essentially in that concept. Um, if it was an unlimited currency, then yeah, you've essentially you had a forecast of how how much currency you should have over a period of time, and then that forecast is blown to hell. Um, which is bound to bother you if you're some sort of economist that has this thing, sound money is predictable high to stock flow ratio. Bottom line, if you have a predictability of what that is, I'm going to have a whole episode on that. I recommend you guys, uh, if you guys want to watch that, I mean, I was going to get kind of way deep down to forecasting cryptocurrencies forward, looking at their their actual uh no known inflation rate. So like if we take something like Raven, it's 5,000 coins per one minute. We can calculate based on that holding true one minute, 5,000 coins, like what next year, how many actual coins will be um, notionally available. And what I mean by notionally is that it's not exactly one minute, it just depends on how difficulty on the network gets. Um, and sometimes it'll be a little slower, sometimes a little faster, but over time it should be one 5,000 coins per one minute. You can do some math. Uh, would we'll pull up Excel and we can forecast that if there's what the market cap and how that's how you can kind of estimate like if you have a currency a year from now and if the Satoshi value stays the same, what is going to be the crypto? What, what's the, what's the market cap going to be? And is is the current is the ecosystem? If all things are being equal and prices were flat, that 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 market cap is going to go up significantly because it's being inflated. Um, uh, 16 billion max supply for Verge is what he's saying. Ravencoin will have 21 billion uh, available, but you can we can calculate like right now there's one billion uh, coins and some change uh, available for Raven right now currently next year to be like 2.3 billion or something right 2.4 billion. So if it stayed at 474 Satoshis, you would have a market cap that's more than double what it is right now, even if the price never went up, right. So you can start to figure out like, you know, is that mean it's going to go up Does it mean it's going to go down, there's a lot more supply. Um, and you know, I, I know it, it, it'll it'll touch the nether regions of people that really care about numbers and uh, you know, counting and all that kind of stuff. But um, we'll have a whole separate thing on that. But, uh, you know, there's there's inflationary curves and figuring out, you know, if you're going to divest or you're going to purchase some that people will start to put into portfolios at scaled if they want to try to, you know, when's a certain supply going to be available and can they get it cheaper and that kind of thing. So that's what they mean by economist money, highly predictable stock to flow ratio. You have some kind of forecast is what that comes down to. This kind of event busts all those forecasts because now you have this huge increase of supply. Um, so let's go on. Uh, however, lowering the difficulty is only half the story. In isolation, this wouldn't actually give the attacker any advantage. The difficulty drastically lowered. Mining blocks becomes easier for the attacker, but it also becomes easier for everyone else. Miners are competing against each other just like before. What would you expect to see is that, yes, the blocks would get mined faster, but the, the identities of the successful miners should be just as distributed and de de Democratic, sorry, couldn't read that for some reason. Democratic is before, which just means like if if they, it's like them pulling the pulling the uh, the difficulty down and going, hey guys, look, it's real easy, and everybody is still dependent on their hash power has a very high chance of winning blocks. So yes, if they had a lot of proportional hash power compared to the entire network at that given time with a low difficulty, they would just have a proportional amount of the output of what their contribution of hash power would be. So if they were 1%, 2%, yeah, they would be getting blocks really fast and they would have a nice supply of income coming in. But technically all they did is just they lowered the gates and everybody's storming the, storming the beaches, right? I mean, it's or storming the, you know, the house and trying to rob all the money. So everybody would have, like overnight, if you were mining Verge and they dropped that difficulty, you just start getting all kinds of currency. So this is when it gets into a little more detail on how they were able to succumb uh, that and keep it for themselves. Um, with the difficulty drastically lowered, mining blocks would be easier and for everybody else competing against each other just like before. What we actually would expect, though, is the blocks get mined faster. I, the identities of the successful miners we just as distributed. Okay, we already said that. Uh, or put in another matter, no matter what the difficulty, a single attacker would still need 51% of the mining power to dominate the network, which is hard as it was before the attack because it's it's... It's agnostic to the difficulty because it's still the amount of hash power that you have. 
Um, however, the hacker didn't, did indeed take over the entire network and was able to do so with far less than 51%. What enabled them to do this is the second component of this exploit, which had to do with the Verge's use of multiple mining algorithms. And then he gets into this site. Verge uses five algorithms. And generally blocks proof of work cryptocurrency are mined with a single algorithm. We all know this mainly because most of the algorithms out there. And I want to be very clear um, not to confuse people that are like doing something like X, X, uh, 16 R, you know, and that has 16 algorithms in one, it's still considered a single algorithm. And what I mean by that, it's a series that are tied together. It's not that I can independently mine script. I can independently, independently mine Blake to S for the same network, right? You know, that's some like wizardry and witchcraft shit, right? So what I'm talking, when I'm when we're looking at X11, X17 uh, by itself, those are a whole bunch of ind- individual algorithms all bound together, and you're doing them in a single series that's considered the same algorithm, and it's named X17 or X16R. Don't get caught up in the wording and the factors that, that there are multiple algorithms. It's not the same as this. Um, so I just want to make sure that was clear. Are you guys following this? Is this too much i mean is this good i'm gonna keep going um but just tell me in the chat so <clears throat> with verge allows the miners to use any different of the five algorithms uh ver- they use script x17 alara rev2 or lira uh two revision two uh grossel uh, my grossel um uh, and blake 2s um the rationale for using multiple algorithms goes something like this. And I'm just going to, I'm just right now at this point, I'm just reading it because I haven't read through all the article and this, I'm kind of getting this as you guys are going and I'm trying to explain it as I go. So, um, some of the critics of Bitcoin argue uh, over time. Oh, thanks for the hundred biddies, buddy. Um, the Bitcoin mining industry has gotten into specialized and centralized mining. And so essentially this is, I'm not even going to cover all this. This is just saying, Hey, we did this because we're trying to make it more decentralized and give people options. You know, you could mine it with script with your, with your ASIC, but you could come into layer two rev two and mine it with, you know, your GPU, right. Or X 17, um, Growstone Blake, I believe now have a six too. So, and you can have, you could mine if you're an ASIC, you can mine. It was like this, kumbaya it doesn't matter we're just doing proof of work give everybody an option that's pretty much all this stuff um coin having the use of multiple algorithms uh purports to be a bulwark against these trends the argument is that controlling five different algorithms in terms of hardware industry resource management and bound hardware is controlling is, is harder than controlling one meaning like if you're bit main you're not going to mine all five algorithms at the same time because you're going to have hardware that mines script you're going to have hardware that mines uh you know uh girl stole you're gonna have all these different currencies that you can and you know you're not going to worry about rev two. like leave that to the gpu guys you're not going to own all five because there's like no point the argument that goes controlling different algorithms in terms of hardware and industry and we already said that person to verge a mining economy into more distributed centralized direction now i stayed away from verge pretty early for a whole bunch of different reasons but one of them was to just this didn't it sounded like a marketing ploy and I didn't really understand. I just, I, I didn't see this issue. I'll be very forthcoming on this, but it's, uh, I just saw that there could be potential issues with multiple algorithms. I didn't, it did not manifest in the fact that this could occur though. So here's the deal. One way to, <clears throat> for this, uh, properly function and properly functioning by this use case is maintaining a 30 second block time and keeping all five algos economically sound for miners and preventing one of the five from dominating would render the whole experiment pointless as to have each algorithm have its own difficult parameter that gets adjusted independent of the four to say script mining is difficultly adjusted to hit 30 seconds block equilibrium as x17 and so on so uh, bottom line if all of them are retargeting based on the amount of hash power let's say you had five separate lanes and in each lane you'd have each algorithm the difficulty for each are going to automatically propagate to ensure that no matter what what you're mining, the block propagation would be the same. So if you have a whole bunch of ASICs on script, it's going to be a very high difficulty. So they're going to be all outputting at any point in time, trying to answer the verge block each time saying, I found it on, on script. It, it's agnostic to those five lanes. So if you have all five lanes competing, it doesn't matter that if any one of those came up with the answer, it was okay. 
don't get confused on the fact that the the particular algorithm being used mattered in any capacity more than trying to find an answer to that number line problem that we were just talking about if that makes sense so the um it, that that just comes down to explaining on how that works um what this means for our timestamps, don't forget that lower difficulty, the whole network, it lowered the mining for all five algorithms. Simply puts, it, <clears throat> the script, it turns out why the script miners now enjoy economically easy mining difficulty and utilize all four algorithms. It rendered their hash power effectively useless for the rest of the network. Crucially, this meant that, you know, so bottom line, it was script. That was the event that created the event. Um, the attacker dominate, there goes from 50% dominating the whole network to just over 10% dominating the script miners. At this point, it gets a bit speculative, but it appeared that the situation got a lot worse than even that. The 10% estimate stems from the fact that the given mining difficulty adjustment adjusted the same amount of economic resources the way uh, should be. Let's see, I lost my place. Roughly the same amount of economic resources should be applied to the five algos, but in reality, however, stubbornly refused to conform to the axioms as part of the. the now, see, I, this doesn't really explain on how they were able to confuse the other algorithms. And maybe that's part of the gap right now is understanding on how it was able to not have that happen. And then they're essentially they get into, uh, you know, kind of throwing a, a shout out to saying, you know, if you wanted to attack a network, if you had this vector, you have places like NiceHash that you can go in on demand by by hash power and then point it to it and then just really get it done. Um, so in some timestamp spoofing makes it possible to drastically lower difficulty Verge uses five algorithms meant to lowering the difficulty for one making it to override the rest of the network lessons learned blah let's see here a few days 30% yeah and they talk about Verge going up in price because it came out with that news about uh, it's uh, Pornhub connection <laughs> I'm looking if there's any more other stuff. This is just some background into interesting proportionally benefits of gravity. Well, uh, gravity, dark gravity wave is specifically states that it is immune to time work exploit, given the decisively this claim has been disproven. So, yeah, any other cryptocurrencies that's using this, you are you are you have an issue. So they need to they need to go and adjust fire on that. Um, update 522 indeed and then seeing the time warp again as the same vulnerability is being exploited as we speak at this word the hacker has two mining algorithms instead of one so they're now attacking it from a couple different fronts now so i don't know I, hopefully that kind of helped as i kind of went through it bottom line i think somebody on the chat kind of actually explained it too is that they were able to use the a mechanism as part of the infrastructure of the way verge is working with the dark gravity wave functionality saying that it, it makes it immune to timestamp exploitation mixed with the fact that it's got five algorithms to not keep it and propagate it to where they couldn't directly attack it just on one because then they would need a lot. They'd need the 51% hash power. So they're able to lock out the rest of the network and do it for a lot less. Bottom line, um, I wanted to, oh, I knocked this off. Sometimes I don't know my own strength. Big ogre sometimes. I push things and they break. Um, so bottom line, I mean, it, it, something like Ethereum or any of this, and this this kind of goes part and parcel of what I always talk about, of like when people are like, oh, Bitcoin, you know, whatever. Bitcoin's, you know, hash rate, total hash rate, and I know it's I mean, a lot of it's probably, I mean, we see the separation by the mining pools of where it's being pointed to, but... hugely more direct 51% protection compared to another. I mean, there's a lot of speculation where if you have multiple mining pools collaborating together, it is they're They're directly incentivized not to do that. Right. I mean, if they want to undermine the entire ecosystem of what they have hundreds of millions of dollars poured into in hardware and sophistication, I mean, really it, it would be a self-defeating thing. So at least the current actors uh, you know, Bitmain and all them, it, it makes no sense for them to directly attack it. They mine Bitcoin too and Bitcoin Cash. So um, 
these kind of exploits are more from people that find find issues in these newer cryptocurrencies that are trying to innovate and in that innovation sometimes offer a, a risk in some of that that innovation so i mean hopefully i don't know if there's been a a traceability matrix built on all the other cryptocurrencies to see any other ones that could ha exploit from this this is one thing I, I i don't see a lot in this space and i'm gonna kind of vent here for a second and i'll get to some of your guys's questions i see some questions about prod broker work i see some stuff about digibyte some other questions i'll get to them guys and thanks for those biddies guys and any of the subscribes and follows and stuff thanks for that guys um but what i would like to see and this is this is kind of typical like if we have like uh, any kind of uh you know, attack vectoring in, in the corporate world. And I'm not weeping. I just, I got a lot of, uh, you know, allergy issues and this time of year for me sucks. So, and I'm not going to use a disinfectant light that might go south quick. I'm going to just clear this off and we're going to kind of whiteboard for a second. And I do have new cable coming for this thing. So you guys will be able to see the whiteboard. I had one, I have it plugged in. It doesn't work. Uh, and I got one that they say is going to work. So we're going to, clear this for a second just in case if i want to use it for for something but um <clears throat> what i would like to see in this kind of space and hell i mean there's no there's like no reason for me to do it for the entire space but it's kind of like sometimes i feel like man maybe maybe i can just help out or something and just like do it and then like post it and maybe people can like i don't know like use it or something but doing a traceability matrix of like crypto And then each of the different attack vectors and say, you know, known, known, you, you start with everything. I start with a known, known setup. You know, what's a, is time warp, uh, given the dark gravity wave now known that that's an issue. What other cryptocurrencies use this for uh, block, uh, adjustment, difficulty adjustment. So it's kind of like the different categories can be up here for like block. You know, you have your main categories, block, uh, times, block adjustments, you know, just like an overall arching kind of matrix that just shows and then highlights those particular ones that are known to have issues right now, highlight them in red and it's leaning forward. It's, 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 uh, it's being re not just reactive, but proactive because a lot of things that happen and this just isn't crypto space guys. This is, this is like business one one a lot of space in general. And it doesn't matter if it's from safety. It doesn't matter if it's from, currencies fintech medical it's the industry as being part of from a solution architecting side if i put that hat on a lot of companies governments people in general work in a safe space from a risk analysis from a reactive standpoint meaning shit will happen and then they'll react to it right oh man damn that totally that's totally a bug we got to fix that versus being reactive in the the spaces that are the highest risk so it's creating a traceability of getting all your known knowns out there like where are probably the risk you know and the people that are developing it to protect their job sometimes they're like oh man that's totally a bug all right man that's totally could go wrong oh nobody will find it with there needs to be an incentive and what I try to do like I'm running programs and stuff with guys is I try to incentivize them to say, dudes, if you're seeing something that's south here, man, let's get it out there. Don't worry about blowing that date. That's what I'll go do. I'll go talk to whoever and we'll go have that conversation. Be like, here's the deal. If they're not hearing me, I'm like, hey, I got one for you. New York Times, March 23rd, 2019. So and so may have or may have not known about this issue. And that conversation goes really different from the leadership standpoint. And then I go give those guys the space to make the change, right? Because I'd much rather have a proactive move toward it. And it's kind of a thankless job. Like people, the end product, they'll get it out there and they're like, they're like, wow, man, this shit works. And there's not too many issues. And you get it through the life cycle of it running and not having as many as problem or not having a cat one bug or some kind of thing like that. But the incentive mechanisms that are set up in place from a revenue standpoint, aren't set up that way in business and cultures in general. I mean, I'm not just talking like corporate businesses, private, public ICOs, 
over promise, over deliver, under deliver, all that kind of crap, right? So stuff like this is a reflection period. So like, that's why I wanted to jump on today and kind of go through it. Let's go through a very well-written paper that I did not write. Somebody else wrote that, but let's, let's pay some homage to it, read through it, see, you know, what they said about it, learn about it a little bit and then figure out, okay, from my perspective, it's like, okay, what, what other currencies have this problem? Right. That was my first thing. Like, man, I read through that time exploits. Oh, shit. This is some problem. This might be some problems. I want to see a matrix. Like, what are the currencies have this issue? Right. The other currencies that have this issue. Again, it's not a direct hack on the currency. It's a direct hack on the business logic that's in the currency to change the outcome. Right. So the block times faster. They can get more currency and they can exploit the system. So you'll see probably some FUD out there that people are like, oh, they hacked the blockchain and changed stuff. And maybe that'll come out where they went out there and they had enough power. And for some reason, they wrote a script to go back and change block headers and like uh, like attempt to change the 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 actual um, sanctity of the currency. And I would say that if that was ever done on any currency, that was not done to profit from. That was done to destroy or create a lack of confidence, which if you're trying to get something from a financial incentive, it seems like not the thing to do is to go break the, the sanctity of it. You already busted the rules. You're in there and you already stole the jewelry. Don't burn them up down. Right. So it's people will learn from it. Somebody ran away with some bounty and the mechanisms that are in place to catch people are out there. Right. Uh, not all these people are caught, but it's one of those things. It's like, what's enough? If somebody busted into Coinbase and somehow got a whole bunch of those cold wallets through the vault and walked away with 600,000 Bitcoin, they'd be like, yeah, we scored. And then guess what? They didn't have anywhere to sell it, right? It's like stealing a Mona, Li Mona Lisa or some painting. That's one thing in the crypto space is that that's going to pass what I would call a receptor out there. And somebody's going to talk to somebody or somebody's going to, it's going to pass a gateway, right? So there, there's an exploitation point to this, that eventual, the eventuality of it, is always a reactive on the people that hack it. Like they're, they're, they're doing it, they get it. And then they're just like, yeah, we won. Well, shit. Now what are we going to do? Right? So the incentive out there needs to be against it to where it's like people are de-incentivized, not just from uh, uh, putting them in jail and all this other stuff. There just needs to be another mechanism. And if that is doing code reviews, if that's doing everything we can do to make it as hard and rock solid as possible. And everybody that always asks me about Bitcoin, like why is Bitcoin valuable? Why is that? Because bro, without anybody giving a crap, it still functions. It works. And if I go to send it to somebody, it, it, it's, it's worked. That chain is, has the most support on it. It has the most security on it. it. It is the digital gold standard when it comes to that. If Bitcoin Cash wants to go out and try to take on the roots of it and say, we want to have these huge lanes and blocks and we want a billion people to use digital currency, that's great. Go with that narrative, right? And that's why I never really talk about Bitcoin Cash much because I don't have necessarily a direct problem with it. I have a problem with it if you try to say you're the other thing. There's two of them and you both have different use cases now, right? Bitcoin is going to become the, the, the gold standard when it comes to if people choose to understand that you have something so finite and so well protected when it comes to the amount of hash power that's on it. And there is a big incentive to make sure that that hash power is spread out of called multiple people, multiple pools. Cause there is a lot of investment in it. It's kind of this double-edged sword like Wuhan and all the guys over in Bitmain trying to like, we're going to get all the pools. That's a horrible idea, right? It's the same way with several of the other pools over the life history of it. 2012, it was uh, something.io. I don't even remember anymore. 2012, they almost had 51%. Community freaked out. Bro, you only had 51%. This is a bad thing because people are going to think that if you had to have enough power, you could go and manipulate the sanctity of the chain, which is going to devalue all that infrastructure and all that money you just put in, right? You have a digital printing press. You are the creator of blocks, right? Or a, a proportionate creator of blocks. It is in your best interest to make sure that the business rules in the system you play by that make sure the sanctity of the, the validity, the immutability of that chain succeeds. You know, I've had this debate back and forth with people. People are like, oh, Bitcoin can be attacked eventually if somebody had enough hash power and they wanted to change it. If they were trying to destroy it and they had enough hardware and they had a script that wanted to go rewrite blocks and take the sanctity of it, anything can be attacked. 
right? It's just highly improbable given the set of circumstances that it's in, right? So that's with any of these cryptocurrencies, right? But I think these are good reflection points. It's at the expense, unfortunately, of any kind of verge holders. Sorry, bros. Um, but you got to come from it. The best thing, somebody that could be really fired up with verge right now is going out and creating that matrix, right? Is created that matrix, figure out like, like, let's do a punch list, right? You know, like what other cryptos are involved in this? Who's at risk? Because I mean, if your bag's smoked right now because the price is going down and shit's not going good, you might have other bros that have other bags and other things and be like, hey, you know, hey, that's got dark gravity wave too, bro. So that kind of stuff is that, you know, I think the reactive things that need to happen right now because we're in a reactive mode. The proactive is going forward that if you're part or responsible for any kind of decision making in this space, especially ICOs or, you know, uh, utility tokens or anything that's out there that make sure that you're not just trying to go straight to market fast and that you're reviewing, you know, a short term gain for a long term loss. If you have a big issue like this, right, you might get that that moment of glory. Woo we're on Pornhub. Oh, my God. Everybody's duplicating our currency or making more currency. Um, like, it's like partying hard and then have to pay the bill the next day, right? So, I'm kind of on my soapbox. 